Welcome to our discussion on the cardiovascular system. Uh, in this segment, we go in depth into blood as part of the cardiovascular system. Uh, keep in mind that blood is going to be our transport vehicle uh, for the organs. Uh, that is, in the sense, this blood uh, carries nutrients, it carries gases, it's going to distribute substances, protect the body in terms of temperature and uh, chemical regulation. So let's go ahead and look into some of the highlights of our assigned readings and some of the main ideas of our course content. And this uh, slide serves as an introduction to this cardiovascular system. Perhaps take a moment to observe the placement of the heart in this diagram and blood vessels coming to and fro from that heart and then also filling up those vessels are going to be uh, blood uh, circulating those important substances. Um, <clears throat> we can generally uh, divide this cardiovascular system into circuits. So for example, in this loop here is showing a pulmonary circuit, and then in the larger loop uh, we see a systemic circuit. Uh, we talk about uh, three main components, uh, the first being the heart, and notice how this heart is actually a double pump. Uh, typically in these diagrams, uh, they use certain coloring. Uh, notice how red uh, tends to uh, show blood that has uh, more rich in oxygen. And in these diagrams, the color blue tends to suggest blood that is lower in the content of oxygen. And uh, let's see, these vessels, notice how we have these large main vessels coming out of the heart. Uh, we discussed these larger vessels in lab. And these larger vessels then lead out to smaller vessels such as arterioles or venules. And then we reach to a capillary bed. Keeping in mind that one of the main goals is to deliver these good substances uh, to all the tissue at this capillary bed. And blood is going to be the... Uh, substance that has all of these uh, gases and nutrients dissolved in them. So again, the idea is that all this tissue in the human body is very hungry for certain chemicals or biological processes. And we also need to get rid of wastes from bio uh, biochemical processes. And the cardiovascular system accomplishes it uh, through these three main features. Also in this diagram, in smaller detail, is noted uh, certain major blood vessels. Uh, students who are enrolled in the lab class uh, will be going more in depth into vessels such as uh, renal arteries or iliac arteries, etc. Uh, the main idea here is that uh, blood is transported away from the heart uh, via the arteries and towards the heart uh, via veins. Uh, then. Uh, we're also going to have these microscopic vessels called capillaries, and those are going to be our exchange sites uh, for oxygen, nutrients, carbon dioxide, and waste uh, products uh, from blood and from tissues. Uh, on this slide, uh, we discuss fluids of the body in just in a sort of uh, general sense. So that means uh, this skin, uh, behind the skin on our body is a variety of fluids. And of course, one of those fluids is blood. And that blood is going to be composed of plasma and a variety of cells. As we said earlier, the purpose of that blood is to transport nutrients towards these cells and get wastes away from those cells. Well, in addition to blood, we're going to have some interstitial fluid, and that's going to bathe uh, generally the cells of the body. And these uh, the cell membranes of these uh, cells are semi-permeable. That means some items can move in and out of there. So nutrients and oxygen can diffuse from the blood uh, into the interstitial fluid and then diffuse into the cells. Conversely, uh, wastes move in the reverse direction. Hence, in this diagram, we can see we have two-way arrows. Now we turn our uh, study to blood composition. Uh, what is blood composition? 
Uh, later on, we'll talk about some functions for blood. In step one of this diagram, we see a blood sample is extracted from the patient. There's the application of the tourniquet allows those veins to be easily visible, thus extracting a sample. As we load that sample into a tube, uh, we then place that tube into a centrifuge. And uh, a centrifuge uh, is a device that spins blood. It's going to uh, cause heavier elements to collect at the bottom. So we start with that whole blood, and as we uh, centrifuge through it, we see that it consists of plasma, and then it consists of formed elements. In addition, in between plasma and the formed element <coughs> elements, uh, we see the presence of a buffy coat. Now, this buffy coat is going to be made up of leukocytes and platelets. Uh, these form less than 1% of blood. So as you might recall from a discussion last semester on types of tissues in the human body, uh, many students are surprised to learn that blood is classified as a connective tissue, and this specifically being to the presence of fibers, and we'll get into those fibers later on. Uh, right about now in the course, we're going to take a closer look at uh, these uh, main four main sections. We're going to go into blood plasma, and then we're going to look at erythrocytes, that is the red blood cells. Then we look at leukocytes, which are going to be our white blood cells, helping the immune system. And then lastly, we're going to talk about platelets, which are in charge of uh, clotting, blood clotting. This slide shows uh, some of those techniques of blood sampling we discussed earlier. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, here we see a median cubital vein is a handy uh, candidate for extracting blood. Now, one might ask, why not stick an artery? Uh, well, these veins are going to be under less pressure than an artery. And these arteries are going to be more deep. Uh, the veins are closer to the surface, hence they make better candidates for venipuncture. So perhaps one uh, philosophical view of blood is to think, imagine if one could invent a quote-unquote sort of super cocktail for the human body, a sort of substance uh, that is able to accomplish many different functions. Uh, that's what blood is. So let's look at some features that help it uh, accomplish many functions. Uh, first off, uh, blood is about four to five times more viscous than water, and that's going to depend on the amount of dissolved substances in the blood. Uh, because it's more viscous, it's therefore going to uh, flow more slowly than water. Uh, blood temperature is approximately one degree Celsius higher than body temperature. Therefore, this is allow, allowing that, warm to, uh, that blood to warm up areas that it moves through as it travels. And notice that we have blood pH of uh, roughly between 7.35 and 7.45. And this pH is going to be crucial to preventing the denaturing of proteins. It's also going to be a nice uh, sort of um, buffer. We can add this uh, neutral substance to other more acidic environments to decrease uh, the extreme acidity of certain organs. Uh, another interesting uh, facts, uh, we're looking at about 8% of total body weight. And in terms of blood volume, uh, this is typically 5 to 6 liters in a male. Uh, maybe four to five liters in females. And the purpose of all this volume is that it's going to provide and maintain blood pressure. So one might think, what are some functions for blood? What are some functions for this a sort of super cocktail of the human body. Uh, one such function is that blood uh, transports oxygen and carbon dioxide to the lungs. In addition, in terms of distribution and transport, it's going to send nutrients to the GI tract. 
in addition, uh, this blood is going to send hormones from endocrine glands. And then also, uh, this blood can distribute heat, and it can also transport waste from systemic cells. In terms of regulation function, uh, blood can regulate body temperature by absorbing heat from cells that surround the blood. And then this heat can also be released into the surface uh, blood vessels. So for example, on the skin, we have many, many capillaries. Uh, the ear, for example, has many capillaries. And as blood flows through these thinner capillaries, uh, heat is able to radiate outward. Uh, in addition, uh, blood is going to provide protection for the human body. As we mentioned earlier, uh, it protects through its pH. Its neutral pH can absorb acids and bases from cells, and that, again, is because it acts as a chemical buffer. Water is a good example. Water has a similar acidity, pH of 7. So blood being close to that allows it to neutralize things. And then also, uh, blood can regulate fluid balance by accepting water from the GI tract and eliminating it through numerous functions. So again, uh, blood has many substances in it, and it also has many uh, functions to it. On the topic of color, uh, the blood color depends on whether it's oxygen rich or oxygen poor. Uh, that oxygen rich blood is going to appear sort of a bright red scarlet color. Uh, that oxygen poor blood is going to appear sort of a dark red, almost somewhat bluish color. As we said earlier, if we thought about the entire uh, entirety of all fluids in the human body, uh, we would see that most of it is other fluids and tissues. A whole blood only encompasses about 8% of that. Uh, so let's take a closer look at that whole blood. As we mentioned earlier, a half of that blood tends to be uh, blood plasma. The other half is generally uh, formed elements. So at this moment, uh, we're going to take a closer look at blood plasma. And we see that blood plasma is mostly water, and then we see that there are some proteins in there as well, and then we're also going to look at some solutes that are dissolved in that blood plasma. Here's, uh, so again, some facts we talked about. Uh, over 90% water, 7-8% uh, are going to be plasma proteins. Uh, these proteins are uh, created in the liver, and because they are so large, uh, they cannot move through uh, cell walls that well, so they are going to be confined to the bloodstream. Uh, we talk about important proteins in blood plasma, uh, ones such as albumin, uh, globulins, and other important proteins. We're going to run through a list of these in a table uh, coming up here in a second. In this table, we're also going to talk about some other important substances such as the solutes. Just because they make up only a small portion of blood plasma does not mean they're not important. Let's take a look at some of these proteins in blood plasma. Let's start by noticing that water is going to be our liquid portion. It's going to be our solvent for the solution. So it's a suspending medium so that all these uh, quote-unquote goodies or substances can be suspended in it. Let's look at our first substance. We have plasma proteins. And one of the interesting ideas about these proteins is they actually exert a osmotic pressure. We might call this a colloid osmotic pressure. And that's going to be the osmotic pressure exerted by plasma proteins. That's going to draw fluid into the blood, and thus it's going to prevent excess fluid loss between capillaries and interstitial fluid. So then we start with our first most prevalent plasma protein, albumins. These are going to be the most abundant plasma protein, and their main function is to exert that osmotic force. Therefore, it's able to control blood viscosity, and in addition, albumins are able to transport fatty acids and hormones. Other proteins include uh, globulins, uh, such as alpha globulins or beta globulins. Uh, these alpha globulins are able to transport metal ions and lipids whereas beta globulins transport iron ions and lipids. Gamma globulins are going to serve as antibodies, which immobilize pathogens. Uh, we'll talk about that when we discuss the immune system later on down the road. 
In addition, we have the plasma protein called fibrinogen that's going to participate in blood coagulation or also clotting as well. And that's going to be able to convert into long insoluble strands of fibrin. Uh, some other miscellaneous proteins we have floating around in blood are going to include enzymes and hormones. We got to remember that those are suspended in there in this important part of this quote unquote super cocktail. Here are those solutes suspended in plasma. Uh, they're going to consist of things such as sodium, potassium, calcium, hydrogen, chloride, bicarbonate, and phosphate. Uh, these all have important functions. Uh, for example, uh, blood contains dissolved organic and inorganic molecules and ions such as electrolytes. Uh, these nutrients, these gases and waste products all make it a solution, a sort of colloid of substances. Let's turn our attention now to a homeostatic imbalance for the cardiovascular system, uh, that is hemophilia. In general, Hemophilia is actually a group of bleeding disorders uh, caused by specific genetic mutations that cause certain clotting factors to function improperly. Uh, the two most common types of hemophilia are hemophilia A and hemophilia B, uh, both of which are inherited uh, from an X-linked uh, recessive uh, genetic system. That means females are typically going to be the carriers, but it's typically the males that have the condition because they only have one X chromosome and their Y chromosome lacks the ability to mask over that trait. We might call uh, hemophilia A the classic hemophilia. Uh, that does represent the vast majority of all the hemophilias. Uh, that's going to be a deficiency or a complete lack of the normal factor eight. Um, and what occurs there is that it affects the clotting cascade. Uh, the protein is abnormal and typically cannot participate in proper clotting of the blood. We're going to talk about these clotting factors in the next part. And then uh, hemophilia B, that's going to be a deficiency of uh, factor 9. That occurs in approximately 1 in 25,000 males in the United States. Uh, hemophilia C is going to be our most rare autosomal a dominant deficiency of a factor 11. How can we cure this homeostatic imbalance? Uh, we can use transfusions of fresh plasma to help bring in uh, new clotting factors to balance out this homeostatic imbalance. Coming back to our idea of whole blood, up here on the pink section. Uh, we just talked about half of it, the plasma constituents, and now we're going to look at roughly the other half of blood, that is the formed elements. And again, these formed elements are a variety and diverse types. Keep in mind they're mostly living structures based. These are mostly cellular based structures. And we're going to find that these cells get formed in a variety of places fetal yolk sac, uh, the liver can form uh, formed elements, spleen can form them but also break them down as well, and then the red marrow inside the uh, medullary cavity of the skeletal system bones undergoes hematopoiesis. That's where we can make new cells. So uh, generally speaking, uh, we can see all of these formed elements in perhaps a blood smear. Uh, and this diagram is showing a histology image of a blood smear. And from that, perhaps you can pick out the red blood cells. More professionally, we call those erythrocytes. Uh, they have the uh, sort of light center. Uh, that lighter center suggests that we're looking at a biconcave nature to those red blood cells. And that biconcave nature is going to allow those cells to sort of slip through those very small uh, slender passages called capillaries where they must drop off their nutrients and pick up wastes. And perhaps you can see that these red blood cells uh, far outnumber the white blood cells. 
So the next guys are the white blood cells, more professionally called leukocytes. These are the ones that picked up the dye stain in the smear. So notice the nucleus especially picked up that smear. Uh, we can see that red, I'm sorry, <clears throat> white blood cells can be categorized in two main categories. That's going to be the granular leukocytes and agranular leukocytes. And when they say granular and agranular, we're talking about the cytoplasm of the cell. We'll take a closer look at these cells later on. Thirdly, another major formed element is platelets. These are going to be special cell fragments. They're not a standalone cell by itself. They're a, a larger cell that has sort of, quote unquote, butted off uh, pieces of itself. Well, let's take a closer look now at our erythrocytes. These uh, erythrocytes, aka red blood cells, are sometimes called a nucleate. That means they have a no nucleus. And not only are they missing a nucleus, they're missing other organelles as well. Uh, that means they cannot take part in cell division, uh, nor can they have mitochondrial ATP formation, in other words, creating energy. So for that reason, they're uh, sadly referred to sometimes as, quote unquote, uh, empty bags of hemoglobin. And that's because the red blood cell's main job is to carry uh, this protein called hemoglobin. And because that protein hemoglobin does have iron at its core, uh, that's what's going to give it a red color. As I mentioned earlier, uh, these red blood cells are uh, biconcave in their shape, uh, about 8 microns in diameter. And uh, this uh, biconcave nature is also going to give it increased surface area in addition to that flexible shape for narrow passages. Uh, furthermore, uh, this uh, biconcave structure, interestingly, also allows them to stack up in a line, uh, I think called rouleau. That's a way that they can then pass more easily through the capillaries. Let's take a closer look now at this uh, red uh, pigmented protein uh, called hemoglobin. And we see that uh, there's going to be four protein uh, building blocks, uh, two being alpha chain globulins and two being beta chain globulins uh, that transport oxygen. Each globulin chain contains a hemigroup which allows for the binding of oxygen to the iron in that hemigroup. Thus, the oxygen can be transported in the blood. Uh, the kidneys are the primary producers of erythropoietin hormone. That's going to be the stimulator for this erythrocyte production. And let's take a break and refer to uh, one homeostatic imbalance, and that is sickle cell anemia. Uh, in this diagram, we see those regular shaped red blood cells that we discussed. And uh, in this diagram, we see a sickle shape, that sort of a C, backwards C shape to it. And uh, students who have were enrolled in the 111, the previous semester's lab, might recall that we did a activity called the BLAST activity, where we uh, tracked down the nature of a protein. Uh, we found that it was a mutated uh, hemoglobin protein. So uh, the point I'm trying to say here is that this uh, red blood cell is deformed uh, by changes in the hemoglobin molecule. And what happens is sickle cell shales, <coughs> sorry, sickle shaped cells uh, rupture easily. And in addition, that sickle shape uh, causes these cells to clot up and not move as fast either. Uh, this, since this is a genetic condition, it's found among populations in the quote-unquote malaria belt. That might be called Mediterranean Europe or certain parts of Africa and Asia. Um, since this is a, a poor condition in the sense that what happens is a person who has sickle cell anemia has low oxygen levels, they're often lethargic and sick and tired. One might think that this trait would be bad and therefore sort of quote unquote weeded out of the genome. That's not the case. Uh, what happens is interestingly a person who is a carrier for the sickle cell condition, that is they only have one sickle cell gene, uh, they have an increased resistance to malaria 
and that's because the red blood cell membranes uh, leak potassium and that lowered levels of potassium kill the parasite infecting the red blood cells. So in summary, sickle cell anemia stays within the uh, genome because as a homozygote dominant, you are okay. Uh, as a homozygote recessive, you are sick with sickle cell anemia, but as a heterozygote, you have an advantage over both as long as you are living under the threat of malaria. Let's turn our attention now to red blood cell production. Uh, hematopoiesis, uh, also called hemopoiesis in the uh, textbook. Students who were enrolled in the previous semester might recall that uh, red bone marrow is located in the center of long bones in the human body. And this process of hematopoiesis is going to take place in the bones of uh, many bones in young children. But however, as one reaches adulthood, uh, hematopoiesis tends to be restricted to selected bones of the axial skeleton. In the diagram, we see that on the left, uh, all cells arrive from the same type of stem cell, a hem hemocytoblast. So a stem cell is a sort of, sort of generic cell and it can evolve and become many different types of cells. As we see, uh, the cell goes through many stages and cells uh, will mature and then commit to a specific blood cell pathway. In this diagram, we're seeing committed cells in a red blood cell pathway are gonna go through erythropoiesis. Later on, we're gonna talk about other things such as thrombopoiesis or leukopoiesis. As well. So let's take a closer look now at uh, erythropoiesis, the formation of red blood cells. Uh, in this process of erythrocyte production, it's going to occur at roughly an amazing rate of 3 million per second. And it's going to be controlled by a hormone. Uh, that hormone is abbreviated as EPO. Uh, that's going to be erythropoietin. Notice that it is going to be a balanced on a homeostatic level, and we see a relationship with the kidneys. The kidneys are the primary producers of EPO, and this EPO is the stimulator for erythrocyte production. Uh, Erythropoietin's uh, release, the release of it is stimulated by an oxygen level decrease in blood, and that becomes detected by the kidneys. This then causes red bone marrow to increase the erythrocyte production. And this results in increase of oxygenated erythrocytes, and therefore a person then has an increase in their blood oxygen levels. So we see that we've once again brought the person back up to a homeostatic balance. On a side note, uh, we see uh, the issue of blood doping is very common and prevalent in today's uh, society. Uh, blood doping is an illegal procedure uh, used by some athletes, and then the result is an increased red blood cell volume. Uh, one method that athletes might perform is to donate his own blood to himself a few days prior to the competition. So what happens is a person removes a unit of blood from himself and then allows time for his body to physiologically replace that removed unit of blood, again, according to the patterns of erythropoiesis we just mentioned, and then he will inject the removed unit back into himself. Thus, he's going to have more red blood cells to carry more oxygen. Uh, another uh, method a person might use is going to be to inject uh, the EPO. Uh, that's a sort of pharma sort, um, sorry, sorry, a pharmaceutical version of erythropoietin. And there's going to be several medical uh, complications associated with blood doping. Uh, one of them is that because we get an increased blood viscosity with these extra cells, that's going to make uh, the heart have to work harder. So obviously, uh, this type of activity is banned. Uh, by Olympic Committee and many other major sports organizations. <laughs>
This slide, uh, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, this slide refers to red blood cell fate and destruction. As we mentioned earlier, uh, being an uh, anucleate uh, cell, these cannot cell divide, they cannot make their own energy. Uh, they wear out, they get torn and worn out. So the a red blood cell's lifespan is on average about 120 days long. So because these cells are unable to synthesize the proteins necessary for repair, it's going to make them more vul <clears throat> vulnerable to wear and tear during circulation. So how do we take care of these old cells? Macrophages, and these macrophages exist in places such as the spleen and the liver. And macrophages will phagocytize old erythrocytes. When we say phagocytize, we mean a quote unquote eat. So imagine a larger naturally occurring cell of the immune system is going to sort of quote unquote gobble up uh, these older worn out red blood cells. Well, afterwards, uh, the iron components of hemoglobin are transported and removed by transferrin to the liver. There, it's going to bind to ferritin, and ferritin is going to be a water-soluble protein and a primary storage center for iron. We then get another split. The hemigroups are first converted within macrophages to biliverdin, then to bilirubin, and that's going to be then a yellow component of digestive secretion called bile. We'll talk about that in the uh, digestive system. Then from bile, it goes then to urobilijunin in the small intestine, where it will either then be converted to stereosyllabin of the feces or converted to urobilin, and that's going to be excreted out in the kidneys. Hence, that's where uh, some urine gets its yellow pigment from. Let's turn our attention now to some homeostatic imbalances, one of those being anemia. There are several types of anemia. We had just discussed one type of anemia, uh, sickle cell anemia. And uh, generally speaking, anemia is any condition in which either the percentage of red blood cells is lower than normal, or there is a decreased oxygen carrying capability of the blood due to uh, hemoglobin abnormalities. How might we overcome this abnormality? Uh, one might eat foods uh, such as these shown on the right, showing a, a nice good source of iron is going to help that hemoglobin molecule out. Whereas anemia is suggesting of a low red blood cell count, polycythemia is too high of a red blood cell count. That would be over around 65%. This polycythemia could come from dehydration, uh, blood doping, as we mentioned earlier, or also we might get polycythemia from being high altitude. In a higher altitude, our body needs to create more red blood cells to cope with the low oxygen levels. In our general discussion of blood, we've talked about the plasma that makes up blood, and we've talked about the red blood cells that make up the formed elements of blood. And now we look at the white blood cells that form up those formed elements, a.k.a. Uh, leukocytes. These leukocytes are motile, uh, flexible, true cells. And when we say they are true cells, that's because they do have a nucleus and they do have organelles. However, these do not have hemoglobin. So therefore, these do not have oxygen carrying capability. What they do have, though, is an ability to defend the body against pathogens. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, we can classify these leukocytes according to the nature of their cytoplasm, whether they are granular or agranular. Something unique to these white blood cells, unlike the red blood cells, is that they can slip out of the capillaries. We call that diapedesis. Uh, diapedesis is the process of leukocytes entering tissues by the act of squeezing between uh, endothelial cells of the blood vessel walls. And what they're able to do then is then be able to migrate to the site of an 
infection. In addition, these leukocytes have what's called chemotaxis. And this is going to be a method by which leukocytes are tracked to the sites of infection due to the release of molecules by the damaged cells, the dead cells, or the path pathogens. Things such as histamines will attract these leukocytes. Similar to red blood cells, the body tries to keep a homeostatic balance of white blood cells, but sometimes we get a higher count. Uh, leukocytosis is a higher white blood cell count, and that's going to uh, suggest the presence of some sort of physical damage. Maybe microbes have invaded uh, the body, there's surgery or anesthesia. Uh, this is going to be uh, recent infection or stress is going to cause an elevated uh, count of leukocytes. On the other end of the spectrum is leukopenia. That's going to be a low white blood cell count. And that could be uh, put a person at risk of developing an infection or decrease their ability to fight an infection effectively. Uh, we turn our attention to a homeostatic imbalance in white blood cells, uh, leukemia. Uh, leukemia is a general term for a sort of malignancy of the leukocyte forming cells. And we have, again, different types of them, and they're going to be classified based on their duration. That is, are they acute or are they chronic? Uh, let's look at some subtle differences. Uh, this acute leukemia is going to progress rapidly. Uh, death typically occurs within a few months after the onset of the symptoms. Uh, so what's going to happen is these persons are going to experience severe anemia, certain types of hemorrhages, and recurrent infections. Uh, these acute leukemias tend to occur in children and young adults. Uh, then we have the chronic leukemia. That's going to progress more slowly and the survival rates are a little bit longer, a little bit more over a year. Uh, again, the symptoms include anemia and the tendency to bleed. Uh, this is going to happen more so in middle-aged and older individuals. Just like red blood cells needed to uh, divide and reproduce, I should say be produced, I should say, uh, under erythropoiesis, uh, white blood cells need to be produced as well. Uh, lo <coughs> pardon me, leukopoiesis is going to be the production of these white blood cells. So recall that a stem cell is a basic sort of stem cell, a basic store cell, a sort of cell that can evolve into multiple different types of cell. So we see that uh, the granulite, <coughs> the granulocyte line develops when the cell forms a myeloblast. And that myeloblast is under the fluence of certain factors that are going to stimulate this uh, progression and growth. Uh, this myoblast is then ultimately going to differentiate into one of those three types of granulocyte classified white blood cells. Uh, like granulocytes, the monocytes are also derived from the myeloid stem cell, uh, but this myeloid stem cell is going to differentiate into a progenitor cell Again, under the influence of certain factors, this is going to form a monoblast. This then starts the monocyte line. Uh, then eventually, the monoblast forms a promonocyte and differentiates into a mature monocyte. Then the lymphocytes are made from lymphoid stem cells. And again, we're going to have a line of progression. We move into a lymphoblast to a prolymphocyte, and then we become a lymphocyte. And when we say lymphocyte, these are later on, we're going to talk about things called natural killer cells. So, for example, these natural killer cells sort of rove around the uh, body to hunt down and uh, quote-unquote kill, like physically actually puncture uh, foreign invaders. So, in summary, a leukopoiesis is the uh, formation of these unique white blood cells from one basic stem cell under the presence of certain factors.
Let's take some time to learn the visual appearances of these white blood cells and then also discuss their functions and in addition we're going to talk about their prevalence as well. We start out with the neutrophil. In this histology image we see a multi-lobed nucleus. These are going to be the most abundant uh, leukocyte and their function is to phagocytize pathogens and release enzymes that target pathogens they're going to give the fastest response of all. Our next type is the eosinophil. We note that by the bilobed nucleus. And again, these are the granulated ones. Uh, these are going to kill parasitic worms, and they also have a role in antigen-antibody complex for allergens. Our next type are basophils. Uh, these are present with a bilobed nucleus as well. However, the cytoplasm of the cell has a sort of purplish-black granulation to it. These contain uh, histaminase for inflammatory responses. So the idea is that these release histamine, and that histamine is going to be a capillary vasodilator, and it's also going to act as an anticoagulant. Uh, we're going to look for these in our lab in case you're enrolled in the lab, and you might notice that these are hard to find. They're going to be the rarest of the white blood cells. In our histology, we now look at a small lymphocyte, and these lymphocytes are going to serve in immune cell activity by attacking pathogens and abnormal or infected cells. Uh, these lymphocytes are also going to produce antibodies. So we call these sometimes T cells, or we sometimes call them B cells. And finally, another type of white blood cell is the monocyte. Mono meaning one, Hence, we have a sort of kidney-shaped nucleus. Uh, these can become macrophages and phagocytize bacteria. Uh, they'll also phagocytize uh, fragments and cellular debris. At this point, uh, we turn our attention to the final one of the formed elements, the platelets, also called thrombocytes. Uh, these guys are going to be fragments of large cells. The larger cells are called megakaryocytes. So in this blood smear, we see the presence of the platelets uh, noted. The function of these is that they are essential in the clotting process. They provide a sort of platelet plug. And in addition, their granules uh, contain chemicals that promote clotting. We can sometimes get homeostatic imbalances of these. Uh, too few of them and blood won't clot such as the hemophiliacs we discussed earlier. And if we have too many platelets, we might get a thrombosis. A thrombosis is a large uh, blood clot that will block a blood vessel. Uh, the production of these platelets is controlled by thrombopoietin. And so thrombopoietin increases the formation of megakaryocytes. And if we have an increase in megakaryocytes, we have an increase of the platelets. Again, like the red blood cells, uh, being anucleate, they have a fate that is short. Uh, roughly around 10 days is how long they last before they are phagocytized. Our last slide that we talk about in this part of blood is simply talking about a complete blood count. Uh, some of us in the medical profession will be doing a test for anemia and various infections. So when we do a complete blood count, we're going to be looking at red blood cell counts, white blood cell counts, and platelets per, whole, uh, per milliliter of whole blood. In the lab, we're going to be looking at something called a hematocrit, uh, these packed amounts of red blood cells. And so we can see on the bottom, here are some normal uh, platelet counts for uh, blood. So that concludes uh, part one of blood. Uh, we're going to have another video lined up here where we talk about part two of blood. And again, we're going to be discussing PowerPoint slides posted on Blackboard.